This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear part of a telephone conversation between a job seeker and a recruitment agent. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Yes, so that's Janet Thompson. Would you like me to spell it? If you wouldn't mind, thank you. Just the surname, please. No problem. It's T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. The job seeker's surname is Thompson so you write Thompson in the space provided. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Yes, so that's Janet Thompson. Would you like me to spell it? If you wouldn't mind, thank you. Just the surname, please. No problem. It's T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. Great. Now, Janet, before we go through the openings I have here in front of me, might I just take a few more details to complete your profile on my system? Of course. What would you like to know? Well, let's start with your email address, please. OK, janthompson at hort.net. I see. Is that Jan as in J-A-N? No, that wasn't available. I had to make do with J-A-N-N. Here, let me spell it for you again, just to be sure. J-A-N-N-T-H-O-M-P S-O-N, at hort.net. Much obliged. And could I ask, do you have your referee details to hand? Yes, what do you need? I need one work reference and one character reference from a friend or colleague. OK, for a work reference, there's Jane Foote. She's my former boss at Bermuda Girls' School, head of English. OK. My personal referee is Monica Carbody. Mon and I have been best friends since we met in Bermuda in 1991, when she was deputy head of English under Mrs Foote. Perfect. And you mentioned, of course, that you're an English teacher, but are there any additional subjects you're qualified to teach? Yes, I have a diploma in special needs, and I can also do history to GCSE level. Very good. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do you think I stand a good chance of finding something? Oh, better than good. In fact, we have some positions we can offer you today. You see, it's not so difficult to find a temporary role. Tell you the truth, there are plenty of them around, but getting a permanent position will prove a little more trying, though. Would you be prepared to take up a position short term? Of course, anything that pays. Excellent. Well, there are three positions that I can offer you right now. The first is a teacher of English in LaSalle School. I'm sure you know it, right in the city centre. Yes, near where I live, actually. Even better. Well, it's a six-month contract, and the very attractive thing about this role is that the head of English at LaSalle will, if she's satisfied with your performance after six months, offer to make you a permanent member of staff. Wow, that's food for thought. 
It certainly is, bearing in mind what I said before about how hard it is to find a permanent role. The second position I have to offer you is in a school near Chelsea. It's called the Chelsea Free School. Are you familiar? I can't say that I've heard of it. Well, this contract is for one year, which is a lot better, looking at it from a short-term job security perspective, than the first role I mentioned. But you also have to realise that you are a temporary replacement for a female teacher who has taken maternity leave. There is no prospect of the position being made permanent. I see. I have one other vacancy at the minute, though I doubt you'll find it quite so appealing. It's situated in rural Cambridgeshire. I'll spell that just in case you want to take it down. C-A-M-B-R-I-D-G-E-S-H-I-R-E. And the school simply goes by the name Cambridge, though it's not in any way related to the other more well-known establishment of the same name. I was just going to ask that. What a lovely location, though, eh? Yes, but there's a catch. It's only a six-week contract to cover for someone on extended sick leave. I see. Well, I guess that's ruled out then. What sort of, sort of salary can I... That is the end of part one. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a talk on the radio about grass roofs. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. And now it's straight into the eco hotspot for today's programme. We are in fact going to look at an intriguing trend in recent years in the world of eco-friendly developments. There has been a constant stream of new green products coming onto the market for the environmentally conscious. A new departure, which I feel needs greater attention drawn to it, is the increasing interest in grass roofs. Environmentalists sing the praises of grass roofs as interest in sustainable ecological building has led to the greening of the rooftops of residential and commercial buildings around the world. And what does this type of roof consist of? Instead of tiles, which allow water to run off and create flash flooding, the roof has a waterproof underlay, which is laid over the roof deck. This waterproof layer is then covered with layers for insulation and drainage. Then, on top of the insulation and drainage layer, is added a final layer of soil or crushed stones for the plants and or grass to grow on. The roof can be planted with wildflowers to add colour and life to your rooftop. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 20. As for the benefits of grass roofs, in spring and in summer they are very pretty as flowers spring into bloom. Moreover, in summer, grass roofs are of particular benefit in cities because they keep any building cool by reflecting the sun's rays. In winter, the grass roofs insulate the building helping to prevent heat loss. 
the roofs require little maintenance and are better than any other roofing material. They encourage biodiversity by attracting bees and birds, and they absorb water runoff, which helps prevent flash flooding. In fact, the gravel layer retains 71% of the rainwater that falls, thus helping to prevent flash flooding. In winter, the brown soil is a bit more evident, which can look unattractive if the roofs are not tended carefully. But that is a price worth paying, and I would say that they come highly recommended by those who have them. If you compare grass roofs with tiles, the latter do certainly look very tidy, but at a price to the future of the planet. The main drawbacks of tiles, though, are the water runoff and the absorption of heat from the sun's rays in summer. So, if we are to save the planet from the ecological point of view, tiles do not come recommended. The only roof that I can think of which has similar ecological credentials to the grass roof is the thatched roof. Thatched roofs are good insulators and very attractive, but very pricey and not ideal for cities. How can we make more of our roofs green? That is, how can people be persuaded to install grass roofs? The World Green Roof Conference in Australia was a very good start. At a grass roots level, the best way to raise the profile of grass roofs is to make them trendy by highlighting them in fashionable magazines so that people begin to feel that they cannot do without them. But the idea I like best is holding competitions for the best designed grass roofs. Next week, Eco Hotspot is going to look at. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear a woman called Phoebe, who is training to be a teacher, talking to her tutor called Tony about research she has done in a school. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. So, how did you get on with your school-based research, Phoebe? Well, it was exhausting, but really valuable. Good. What was the specific focus you chose? My title is Attitudes Towards Study Among 11 to 12-year-old Pupils. Right, and what made you choose that focus? Well, <laughs> that's a bit difficult. Lots of my classmates decided on their focus really early on, mainly on the basis of what they thought would help in their future career, you know, in their first year's teaching. So that's what helped you decide? Actually, it was that I came across a book written by experienced teachers on student attitudes, and that motivated me to go for the topic. OK. So what were your research questions or issues? Well, I wanted to look at the ways students responded to different teachers, particularly focusing on whether very strict teachers made teenagers less motivated. And from your research, did you find that was true? No, not from what I saw, you know, from my five days observation, talking to people and so forth. OK, we'll talk about the actual research methods in a moment, but before that, can you briefly summarise what your most striking findings are? 
Well, what really amazed me was the significant gender differences. I didn't set out to focus on that, but I found that boys were much more positive about being at school. Girls were more impatient. They talked a lot about wanting to grow up and leave school. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. From doing the research, it was clear to me that you might start out to focus on one thing, but you pick up lots of unexpected insights. Right. Did you get any insights into teaching? Yes, certainly. I was doing a lot of observations of the way kids with very different abilities collaborate on certain tasks, you know, help each other. And I began to realise that the lessons were developing in really unexpected ways. So what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I know it's necessary for teachers to prepare lessons carefully, but it's great if they also allow lessons to go their own ways. Good point. Now, I'm really pleased to see you doing this. Analysing and drawing conclusions based on data. But surely this isn't proper data. Because it's derived from such small-scale research. Well, as long as you don't make grand claims for your findings, this data is entirely valid. Mm. I like the way you're already stepping back from the experience and thinking about what you've learned about research. Well done. But I know I could have done it better. As you become more experienced, you'll find ways to reduce the risk of difficulties. OK. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, let's look in more detail at how you gathered your data. Let's start with lesson observation. Well, it generally went quite smoothly. I chose my focus and designed my checklist. Then teachers allowed me into their classes without any problems, which surprised me. It was afterwards that the gruelling work started. Yeah, it's very time-consuming, isn't it? Making sense of analysing your observation notes. Absolutely. Much more so than interview data, for example. That was relatively easy to process, though I wanted to make sure I used a high-quality recorder to make transcription easier. And I had to wait until one became available. Right. And did you interview some kids as well? In the end, yes. I talked to ten, and they were great. I'd imagined I'd be bored listening to them, but... So it was easy to concentrate? Sure. One of the teachers was a bit worried about the ethics, you know, whether it was right to interview young pupils, and it took a while for him to agree to let me talk to three of the kids in his class, but he relented in the end. Good. What other methods did you use? I experimented with questionnaires, but I really regret that now. I decided to share the work with another student, but we had such different agendas it ended up taking twice as long. That's a shame. It might be worth you reflecting on ways you might improve on that for future projects. You're right, yeah. OK. And the other thing I did was stills photography. I didn't take as many pictures as I'd hoped to. Lack of time? It's pretty easy just snapping away, but I wanted each snap to have a purpose, you know, that would contribute to my research aims, and I found that difficult. Well, that's understandable, but remember... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a talk given by a guest lecturer in the continuing education department. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Continuing Education Department for hosting this series of lectures on People Behind the Names You Thought Were Fiction. Welcome to this talk on The Grand Old Duke of York. I'm sure you're all familiar with the old nursery rhyme, The Grand Old Duke of York, he had ten thousand men, he marched them up to the top of the hill, and he marched them down again, and so on. But did you know that the Duke of York, immortalised in this popular song, was actually Frederick Augustus, second son of King George III of England and Queen Charlotte? He achieved fame in this way because of the humiliation he suffered at the hands of the French during the Revolutionary Wars at the end of the 18th century. Frederick was born on the 16th of August, 1763, and from the age of 17 he had been trained as a soldier. When war broke out between England and France in 1793, his father, the King, insisted that he should command the British contingent that was being dispatched to Flanders to cooperate with the Austrians and the Dutch. The Duke was a brave soldier, but remember he was only thirty at the time. Not only was he young, but he was also inexperienced in battle, and was unable to cope with the enthusiastic French Revolutionary Army. He was let down by his allies, too, and in spite of the arrival of ten thousand fresh troops from England, his campaigns were a disaster. He was driven out of Dunkirk in September 1793, Flanders in May 1794, and Belgium in July 1794. Finally, during the winter of 1794 to 1795, his army retreated to the border of Hanover, and, with his unsuccessful campaigns over, the Duke returned to England. It was after this military fiasco that the Duke of York came to be, rather unkindly, satirised in song. Would you believe, despite all this, King George III arranged his son's promotion to the position of Commander-in-Chief of the Army in 1798, and in the following year he was appointed to command an army sent to invade Holland. Again he was unsuccessful, and this confirmed the general opinion that he was not capable of commanding an army in the field. Nevertheless, the rhyme is a bit cruel and harsh, because it doesn't take into account the nature of the soldiers who served with Frederick. All the blame for lack of success should not have been attached to the Duke alone, because the army he had under his command was made up from what is commonly described as the scum of the earth. This is a somewhat offensive term used to refer to a group of people regarded as despicable and worthless. Who were they, these ordinary soldiers? Well, they were mostly vicious, brutal ex-convicts, or raw recruits, and elderly men. The officers who commanded them were all untrained as military men. In fact, they were anybody who could afford to buy a commission. Uh, but here's the really great thing that, unfortunately, the Duke of York is not remembered for. He realised that this was a hopeless kind of army, and he set about improving conditions in order to recruit higher quality soldiers. He introduced padres. Are you familiar with the term? No? Well, let me explain. You see, members of the British armed forces are generally Christians of one denomination or another, and a padre is a Christian cleric or chaplain who ministers to the soldiers and attends to their spiritual needs without belonging to any particular grouping within the Christian faith. Now, ah, where was I? Yes, Frederick introduced padres, doctors, and veterinary surgeons to the battlefield. Why vets? To attend to the horses, of course. 
Remember, we're talking about late 18th century battlefields. He was also the founder of the Royal Military College for the Training of Officers at Sandhurst. Yes, the very same one where the princes and other members of the royal family receive their military training today. Frederick also founded the Duke of York's school in London for sons of soldiers killed in battle. His name is perhaps better commemorated by this school in Chelsea than by the column that stands at the top of Waterloo Steps in St. James's Park. In 1807, the Duke was involved in a scandal with a woman and, as a result, resigned as Commander-in-Chief. But he was reinstated in 1811 by his elder brother, the Prince Regent, who later became George IV of England. He continued in this post until his death in 1827. That is the end of Part 4.